What is your dream for your child? Your plans may not have included having to pay for education or for extra help on top of school. Today, our guest, John Chapman, is going to be talking about this very relevant financial question. How do I balance meeting my child's educational needs with long-term saving and my other expenses? This is LD Expert Live. I find that parents everywhere want their children to grow up to be happy, successful, independent adults. At Stowell Learning Centers, that's what we want for your kids too. When you have a bright child who struggles with dyslexia or learning disabilities, or who always seems to have to work harder or longer than expected, the reality is that in spite of their intelligence, there is something some roadblock to learning that may get in the way of them being as independent as possible. And it probably won't go away without help. At Stowell Learning Centers, we don't give students workarounds or compensating strategies. We have answers and real solutions to learning and attention challenges. We know what we do works. We also know that it's an investment. So I'm really pleased to have John joining us in a minute to provide some insights about this and to answer your questions. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific on Facebook and YouTube. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder and author um, founder of Stowell Learning Centers. <laughs> um, and with me today is Lauren Ma, the director of Stowell Learning Centers in Irvine, in Orange County, California. Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, be sure to uh, say hi in the comments. We, we look forward to chatting with you. So I'll be moderating, taking questions and comments. So I always like to see who's here. So say hi if you're with us this morning. And I'm really excited about today's topic because it is summer and summer has kind of officially begun. Schools are starting to finish up their remote learning and we are getting into summer schedules. And so this is a really unique time in history and is a summer like no other uh, when kids don't have a lot of other activities to do. So I'm getting a lot of questions from parents at our center about taking advantage of this summer and doing summer intensives this year. And so this is this is a, a great topic. So helping parents budget and, and see how they can take advantage of the time that we've all been blessed with this year uh, and, and budget for getting a lot of really good work done and closing that gap for our kids this summer. So I'm really excited about today's topic. Thanks, Lauren. Well, if you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell. Our guest today is John Chapman. John is a fee-only financial advisor, meaning he has never paid a commission of any kind, but he has a legal obligation to provide unbiased and trustworthy financial advice. I had a great conversation with John, and I could tell that he loves really getting to know the families and businesses that he works with. He prioritizes his clients' values and goals and takes the time to listen to their unique stories so that they can work together to develop a clear vision and a financial plan to support it. Welcome, John. I'm so glad to have you here today. Thanks, Jill. I'm honored to be here and I'm excited to talk with your guests. You know, special outside services for students with learning challenges can literally change their lives. Mm -hmm. We see it all the time, yeah. but many families do wrestle with how to manage the added costs. Yeah. 
there's a huge challenge, not only in just raising families with young kids, I'm a parent of three young children, but the added cost, especially for families that have maybe a, a child with a learning disability can sometimes feel really concerning. I also know that because I have a brother with Down syndrome and I've been able to watch my parents as my brother has just grown up and needed some extra services. So while while it might not be just Down syndrome, anyone with uh, an extra need from a learning disability, parents are probably thinking, how how is this going to all fit into the income and expenses that I already am dealing with? So it, it, it's an important conversation to have. It, it really is. I mean, it's, and I know, uh, you're in Orange County. I'm in Southern California. I mean, all of our centers are in Southern California, and it is uh, it's expensive to live here. So, to uh, manage some extra expenses can be, you know, a challenge, no matter what it is for a family. Yeah, I think some of the statistics, at least in Orange County, California, where I'm located, the median household income is just under $150,000. It's like $127,000. Um, and at the same time, the median home price is just over $800,000. And so just to even save up, if someone wants to buy a home, it, you know, it, it could take a decade or more just to get the down payment. And so you tack on things like uh, wanting to save for retirement or wanting to provide for your kids for their education. And so um, these are just important conversations. Every family is so unique. And so it's hard to put, you know, major uh, rule of thumb prescriptions to it. But, um, but yeah, I think that's some of the things I'd, I'd like to be able to talk about today. So what advice do you have for parents thinking about this? Um, the, the first couple of things that we need to start with is just taking a step back and understanding what the opportunity is for your family. I think, Jill, we, we first talked about just, I think, in the heat of the moment, um, uh, when, when we're starting to look at all the problems, our, like our, our emotions can sort of become heightened to such a way where it's, it's not letting us really think about what the future was going to look like from an opportunity standpoint and some of our, what our goals are. So I, as always with a financial planning conversation, actually before getting to some of the numbers, it's so, so important to think about what's important to my family where do I hope for my family to be over the next coming years? What's possible for my children? Uh, what are my educational goals or my their independence goals? And so I think Jill, just you know, taking a step back and finding a way to let some hot air out if if somebody is starting out feeling a little bit anxious, and and to reorganize their thoughts and to start kind of working from from the from a forward and then coming backwards from there. Yeah, you, you've you talked about um, kind of the idea of starting with the end in mind, which, you know, when we work with students, um, we know this is, this is not a super short-term process, but it's certainly not a forever process either for our students. But, but we're always looking at where, where do we want them to be what what is our goal for them when they're finished with us? So um, I I liked you know kind of how you when we talked talked about well with finances you kind of have to start with the end in mind also. Definitely, uh, my favorite author is Stephen Covey. He wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, and his first two habits are first be proactive and second start with the end in mind. And we can apply that to all activities. Um, you know, when we're faced with educational goals, when we're faced with financial goals. And so I think to start out for the families that are listening, if you've, if you've been concerned about trying to match up your expenses for whatever they are, maybe just um, dealing with, with your children's learning disabilities or, or anything, you have to be proactive, meaning you probably need to talk to a professional. And then the second thing, just start with the end in mind. What would it look like in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, if we can even think that long, um, for my family? And then you could go through different thing. You know, there's some categories to think about in these goals. And then I'll transition Gil, Jill after this, after I talk about it, but there's uh, six F's. I like to, there's a, there's a podcast host named Clay Clark, and he likes to categorize goals falling into to six categories. And they all start with an F. It's hmm. faith, family, finances, fitness, fun, and friends. 
<laughs> so yeah, maybe we can put that in right. after this. But uh, faith, family, finances, fitness, fun, and friends. So um, even if you can go through with that alliteration, the purpose for having this structure is because you can use each of those Fs to think about, okay, here's the category. And then here's the time frame that I'm thinking about. You know, in, in the course of the next two years, it'll be successful if my faith is like this, if my family is like this, if my finances mm -hmm. are like this. Wow, I really like that. Um, you know, I, I, when we were talking about this, I appreciated your perspective and I could tell, you know, you were really interested in what we do as a center and what we do uh, to help students around the country. And, and I know, you know, I get the impression with all of your clients, you're very, um, you're very interested in their story and where they're headed. And, and as we talked, you talked about uh, help for your child being an asset. And, you know, we usually don't quite think about it in those exact terms. We know it's something good for our kids. That's why we want to do it. But, but in terms of money, that's, I think that's a really helpful perspective. Can yeah, you I'm, I'm, talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about that. The idea of an asset versus liability. I'm taking a little bit of creative license when I'm thinking about this because it's not the textbook definition of an asset. It, an asset being something that produces income, a liability that takes income. But mm -hmm. if we think about children, and I'm not saying this is perfect and that, you know, I always look uh, at my children even or any children in this way of sort of financially related. But I do want parents to consider the, the what feels like an expense, um, if that's an expense going toward an asset uh, versus an expense going toward a liability. And just to use a couple of quick examples, um, you know, expenses that go toward assets, that's like buying seeds for your harvest. You have to buy the seeds and you have to plant it and you have to work that farm, but eventually it will grow and produce beautiful flowers versus you're, you're having an expense for something that uh, you'll never see produce any fruit for you in the future. Um, and, and, you know, so, so that's where I think we've talked about goals, which are the six F's, but now we're talking about the opportunity set. Like what's, what's going to get my child to that? Uh, what's going to be the leverage point to get them to the goals? And that's the opportunity. And, and one of those things is the Stowell Learning Center, which, which comes with a cost. And so mm -hmm. I, I've, even in the families that, that I've helped guide over the past 10 years in financial planning, um, not all expenses are created equally. And even though you're not going to necessarily see on a statement, um, you know, a return on investment, so to speak, for things like the Stowell Learning Center, um, they still will be an asset to you because of what that's going to produce in the future. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so if we want to have our children be independent uh, functioning members of society. They've got a full-time job. They've already maybe graduated from a four-year university. They're eventually going to be living on their own and having full-time employment. So that's the end of asset uh, that we have to think about in the future. Um, but today it's going to take a cost to get them there. Like I said, Stowell Learning Center being, being one of those things. So mm -hmm. um, just, just to tie a bow on it, I think it's important for families that feel like they're grappling with the expenses of today, here and now, um, if, if at all possible, when we're going through a budget sheet, just do a T chart of what are expenses that are going to be providing me things in the future versus what are things that are taking thing, taking money from me and aren't providing things for me in the future. So, you know, we can think about having like a T chart on our budget, you know, instead of just listing out your mortgage and your insurance and your car and, you know, your education, you can also reorganize it and think about, well, what's, what's an asset versus a liability. Mm -hmm. Just to give you a, another way to to kind of think about it, to to prioritize, I guess. Um, yeah, exactly. It's a, it's a, just another way to be looking at the expenses of here and now in a different perspective. You know, mm -hmm. because they're they're all going to be draining our bank account, but are they going to be giving us something in the future? Right, right. So. Um, you know, I mean, I certainly am biased about this, but but Stowell Learning Center is is 
one of those really valuable tools. It does come with a financial and a time cost. I mean, sometimes finances aren't even the big issue. Sometimes it's time, but whatever it is, we still have to, to kind of allocate, you know, really look at all the pieces. Right. Um, but, um, and, and maybe you covered this, but what, what, else can you tell parents as they look at their finances and their cash flow in order to you know determine what's realistic for them with any big financial decision yeah definitely I, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up Jill because now it comes to a little bit of since we've talked about goals and the opportunity and maybe shifting our frame of reference now it comes to the here and now it's how do I put together my cash flow and how do I put mm -hmm. together my budget? And so maybe I can talk for a few minutes just on how I think about structuring that for families and just give them a few added tools or things to think about. So um, maybe, maybe the first thing to think about is just once cash is coming in, uh, what's, what's happening before that takes place? I just want to use an example of, let's say, um, $100,000 of household income. I get in some areas, maybe that's high, uh, maybe for, for true working spouses, maybe that's on the lower end, but whatever that looks like, just for using round numbers. But before that money even comes in the door, let's assuming somebody works a corporate job, uh, different from maybe being an entrepreneur or a small business owner, this might come in a different order. But before the $100,000 comes into the bank account, Taxes are taken out. Medical expenses or you know, your healthcare premiums are taken out. And maybe some 401k or retirement savings are taken out. So there's three things that are taking you know, money and setting it aside. Um, some's assets, some's liabilities. And so just something for, for people to think about, on average, most corporate employees are gonna see about 65% of their take of their gross pay of, of what their salary is. So if the salary's 60 or a hundred thousand dollars, someone's going to see $65,000 that actually lands into their bank account. And this is all budgeting conversations can now happen based on that $65,000. I'm looking down at my calculator because I can't do mental math. So I just <laughs> want to make sure I have this right. This is, that means there's 5,000, $400 and then per paycheck, you know, what, what would that be divided by two? That's $2,700. So families that have this situation, they're going to need to think, uh, you know, how am I going to base all of my living expenses <laughs> uh, based on this uh, take home pay what's actually getting to my bank account? And that's probably two paychecks of 2,700. So uh, I've, I've got a few more things to talk about, Jill. I hope it's okay that I'm going to go on a roll because I want to talk about how to think about an emergency fund, how to think about short-term expenses, and how to think about long-term expenses. But I just want to pause here. I want to make sure I'm staying within the guardrails. Are there other things that we should be talking about before we go through this example? No, I think that's really, uh, this is really helpful. And, you know, I mean, we all know when we get our paychecks that they are less than, you know, they're way less than the gross. Um, but, but that's just a helpful number to know that, that about 65% actually lands in our bank account. So it gives us a framework to work from. Yeah, exactly. I think, and that number changes. Uh, some people that's 50%, maybe they've got a, a lot of taxes or they've got a lot of 401k deductions or high health care or whatever the case is. Maybe it's it's over closer to the 70% level, but 65% is just on average what I see for most families out there. And another reason for thinking about this is because budgeting is hard. It is so hard. It's hard for me and I'm a financial professional. I, I, I It pains me to do my budget every month. But what, what helps me is I usually know what my net income is going to be, what per paycheck it's going to be. And some people have commissions and I get that there's variable income, but it's important to then just say, okay, if I can base my family living on this uh, two paychecks of two, 2,700, a lot of things can start to fall into place from that. Mm -hmm. 
So let me first talk about um, if someone's confused on organizing their finances, they they might already know some of this information. You know, there's people like the Dave Ramsey's out there. Maybe you've had a, a course, a financial course, but I'm just going to start from square one here. So hang okay. with me for anybody that's that that might know this information. Uh, the first thing we need to do is have an emergency fund that is three to six months of what our take home pay is. So again, our take home pay of let's say a little over $5,000, um, just three months of expenses is $15,000. So if I could say one thing to a brand new family that I'm working with, the first thing I'm thinking about is what are your goals? What are the opportunities? What's your income? And now once I know your income, here's how much we need to have as our emergency fund. It's at a minimum three to six months. And some for, some families feel like that's, gosh, that's a lot of money. Like I'm never going to be able to get to $15,000. I've never ever had $15,000 in my savings account. Um, you know, so uh, I get that that number on the surface might look or feel big. Other people feel like, wow, that's too much money to have in cash. I want to invest it. Um, but I just, I want to warn against both of those, those uh, concerns. Um, all energy should be put towards beefing up the emergency account if somebody is not at that level. So that's number one. I'm going to move on, Jill. Um, uh, number two is prioritize what debts someone has. Uh, this is where the Dave Ramsey comes in a little bit. You can prioritize things like credit card debt, student loan and college debt, or maybe third, something like a car loan or a mortgage. So whatever your priority is, and then you should work with a financial professional to think about your top to bottom. But let me just pretend uh, it usually goes with paying credit cards first, uh, maybe car loans and student loans and then a mortgage. So it, you know, if you've got some credit card debt after you do the emergency fund, then go tackle that credit card debt just as fast as possible. If you, if you don't have any, and you maybe just have either like a car loan or a mortgage, then we can maybe skip to that next level where we start to think about short-term expenses or short-term investing versus long-term investing. So I'm going to pause again, Jill. We've talked a little bit about emergency fund. We've talked a little bit about debt. I could talk about short-term investing and long-term investing, but all of this is leading up to how somebody can think about the expense of something like a Stoll Learning Center or anything for children with disabilities. Right. So let's pause there. How, how, how do you feel like you're thinking about, or maybe the people that you've talked about, how, how do they, um, you know, or have they expressed how they're thinking about what their financial obligations are? Are we on the right track with this conversation? Oh, I think we're definitely on the right track. I, to be honest, I think most of us just get pretty overwhelmed about all of the expenses in our life. And um, I don't know how many of us out there really budget, you know, carefully and, and, and really know how to, to think about all of this. So I think this is really helpful. Yeah. It, you know, and again, the, the budgeting is hard and whether or not somebody keeps track line by line of every expense, you know, Netflix, $8 and 90 cents. And, uh, you know, my internet and cable, $120. Um, that's to me, it, this is John speaking, you know, just John, your friend, uh, not a financial professional here, not a recommendation. Uh, that's just hard for some people. So I get that. So, mm -hmm. um, but, but what maybe what's easier is just having a rough number of what their take home pay is. And then they can kind of base everything off of that. So mm -hmm. um, let's move on to then think about um, short and long term. And then we can think about some other framework for expenses. Um, and, uh, and so w once we've started to beef up an emergency fund, once we've started to tackle or prioritize what debt we have, now we're on to our uh, short-term savings or our short-term expenses. You know, if um, it, there, there's a there's a saying in the financial world called matching assets with liabilities. Um, but all we're saying is, you know, if we know that there's going to be a, an expense in a few years, um, let me pick on Stoll Learning Center. Uh, I know that for the next two years. My, 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 my child is going to go through this in-depth learning process um, and I need to commit to it, then I want to start to be focusing on that from my cash flow right now because I know that's a near-term expense. And so, um, you know, that's the next sort of bucket of money that you want to pull into. So you've got your, your uh, 2700 per month or per paycheck coming in. You've already got an emergency fund. You've already got money going to pay towards some debts. The next place that we're mentally thinking about where money is going to go are to some of these short-term 
uh, expenses, short term being anything between a one to five year time frame. Um, you don't need to invest that money. You can keep it in a money market or a CD or just in your savings account. Um, but uh, I'm still categorizing that as short term investing. Maybe you can if you've got a good risk tolerance. And so um, let me just say one, one other couple of quick last things about long term. And then I want to come back to talking about, um, you know, income and how this expense fits in. So um, one thing on for those listening about how they're they're uh, saving for long term investing, let's say something like retirement or financial independence, whatever we want to call it these days, just a, a, a rule of thumb, if I can give you one um, in order to try and keep your lifestyle at some point in the future um, and give yourself about the same amount of income in the in retirement that you have during your working years you should try and save around 15% of your gross income on $100,000. That's $15,000. That's about uh, what, what $1,200 per month. And that could be happening from your 401k and maybe a little bit extra from, uh, from your net paycheck. That, that, that's hard for a lot of people. We know with the statistics, most people have less than $200,000 saved in retirement. So I, I recognize that's a stretch. But I, if I can challenge some people to think about it, 10 to 15% of their gross income, that's set up their retirement bucket. So um, again, if we've got 65% coming in minus the 15 for long term, when you're thinking about your, your, your expenses, you really want to look at 50% of your take home pay. Let me pause there, Jill. Uh, we can talk a little bit about, um, you know, different different f frame of reference or, or ways to think about, um, you know, near term expenses. But I, I just keep me on track here. What else has come to your mind as we've been talking? So the last statement you made, you said um, you really need to be thinking about 50 percent of your take home pay. So you're talking about for 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 your day to day expenses. And yep, and right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's um, that's both your housing allowance, whatever that's your mortgage or your rent payment. Uh, that's your utilities. That's your gas. That's your food, and that's your fun. And so again, one of these sort of quick sort of budgeting hacks. Whatever your gross income is, hundred thousand dollars. Take half of that, fifty thousand dollars, divide it by twelve, and that's what everything needs to live within. You know, that's going to be whatever that is, $4,000, a little over $4,000. So if I've got $2,000 going to rent or my mortgage, I've got $2,000 per month going towards some of my other services. So the big question then is something really important comes mm -hmm. up as a short term yep. investment, but you know, it's important. It, you know, is, is going to be outside of what I typically yep. spend. Yep. How do families think about that? How do they deal with that? Really good question, Jill. And I'll acknowledge that it, it can be a hard conversation. And, and it's also hard for me to give advice only because every family is so different. Some mm -hmm. families are dealing with changing, uh, you know, job changes or even a job loss like amidst coronavirus. Um, other people have dual income. Other people have uh, other, you know, retirement savings that they may be able to tap into or investment accounts. Some people have family members that are willing to step in at a time like this. And so I throw all these out there because I want people to just be thinking about what are the tools in their tool belt that they have access to them when something, um, you know, that's, I don't want to say abnormal, but beyond just a regular expense, mm -hmm. um, you know, comes up is just look at all of the tools in my tool belt. Should I be holding off on my long-term retirement savings? Could Maybe I could do that for a few years if I know that I've got just a near-term expense. Um, could I be politely asking some, some family members if that's appropriate, uh, maybe asking grandparents or an aunt and uncle? Um, could, could I be reducing my, um, my standard of living and just really making it tight or, or selling some things that I have that I don't really need anymore or just having one car? I mean, I'm just, I'm just throwing out ideas because um, people need to look at this from all angles and, um, you know, and, and just be considering all the tools in their tool belt. So um, that's probably the first thing that people need to think about. Um, maybe another way that I think about this, Jill, we, we talked about this. Um, most people, 
are going to be spending almost every dime that comes into their bank account. And so uh, let's pretend that it's not this sort of theoretical world like I just talked about where everyone's saving on these percentages and they've got their long terms at 15%. Let's just pretend somebody is spending every dime that comes into their checking and savings from their net paycheck. Let's just take a step back and think about over the next 10 years, somebody that makes $100,000 that sees $65,000 come in after taxes, retirement, and medical premiums. Well, over the next 10 years, $650,000 is going to flow through someone's bank account. And that feels like a really big number uh, sometimes, but that's the truth. That's going to be flowing through your bank accounts and, and exiting on the other side with whatever you have. And the reason I bring it up in such a big number is because an expense to help your children, like a Stowell Learning Center or anything else to help children with learning disabilities, um, whatever that cost is, maybe that's $5,000. Maybe that's $50,000. Well, how am I thinking about this $50,000 expense or $20,000 or $5,000 expense in light of the fact that I'm going to have $650,000 flow through my bank accounts? And if I think about it from that long-term context, it's sometimes a little bit easier maybe to chew on and say, okay, I'm going to pour everything I have into this this expense that's an asset for my children um, because I know it's it's not going to last forever. I know it'll pay dividends and uh, I can maybe adjust my lifestyle and adjust other places that I'm either saving into or spending from and prioritize this in the heat of the moment. Mm -hmm. That is that is really helpful actually to to think of it in light of of a bigger picture because it's hard to get away from how am I going to manage today? Yeah. So, so that is a helpful perspective. Um, you said something about uh, people's holding off on their retirement account or something like that. If someone were to say, and I'm not even sure, you might have to correct me here, but, but if someone were to say, pause their 401k contribution, what would that look like? I mean, is, is that something you're allowed to do? What does that look like? Really good question. Um, so let's think about if, um, you know, it's hard to manage everything that's coming in and going out. And so one of the tools in the tool belt might be something like pushing pause on saving into anything long term so I can pour everything into my short term. And uh, in the ideal world, the theoretical world, uh, we'd be having all of our buckets lined up and still be saving for long term. And every financial professional might have a different view, but I can reasonably see and make a case or make an argument for people pausing basically everything and just trying to take care of the expense here and now if they can commit or, uh, you know, to, to, to getting back on track for long-term savings in the future. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna talk out of two sides of my mouth here for just a second, because I wanna talk about the compound growth calculator. Jill, we talked about this before, and mm -hmm. I wanna talk a little bit about the opportunity set for families, and I just wanna encourage families to think about, you know, saving for the long-term, but I also want to then talk out of the other side of my mouth and say, it's okay to pause on that. So this may be hard for some of the viewers to see. It's an Excel spreadsheet. I just want people to show things like compound growth calculators that are out there. Again, Dave Ramsey has one. And maybe if you just search on the internet, I'm not sure if people can take a screenshot or see if this is available. I just want to be able to show the power of starting early and the power of continuing to save hard and fast um, as quick as possible, um, because then you get the most out of that in the long term. So I'm going to go through the numbers very quick. Let's just assume on the left-hand side of this Excel spreadsheet that uh, for 10 years, somebody saves $10,000. Okay. So that's a, that's a big dollar amount, but just go with me because I'm using round numbers. Um, they save $10,000 uh, per year for 10 years. So uh, and let's say they invest that money. Maybe it's a retirement account or maybe it's an investment account uh, or wherever. And, and let's just pretend they can grow it at 8%. Again, the market doesn't really work that way. But if you average it out over time, uh, let's just use 8%. Well, where where does that leave somebody? They only put in $100,000 and then they literally stop saving for the rest of their working career. 
Well, after 50 years, where does that number get to that hundred thousand dollar investment? After 50 years, that gets to $3.7 million, sort of a, a mind blowing number, um, but really shows what the power is. It takes forever to get to a hundred thousand dollars. It takes forever to get to a million dollars. And then basically all of a sudden at the end of that curve, kind of like a hockey stick, you go from a million dollars to $2 million to $3 million, only just on working hard for 10 years um, in savings. Now I want to compare that really quick, Jill, to looking at another graph. Let's say somebody saves zero, not a dime for let's say the first 10 years. Um, what amount do they have to save to try to catch up to that first person? Um, well, this shows an example of, of 20 years of saving $10,000 per year. Again, investing that money at an 8% just so we can try to show apple to apple. So they do nothing for first 10 years. They save $10,000 for 20 years. So double the amount of time as a first person. Where does that end up after 50 years when they're in their 70s? Just $2.4 million. That's a difference of $1.3 million on these two. And, and really the, to take away Jill, and then I'll pause on this, I'm talking a lot of numbers, is just, I want to encourage people that are out there listening to understand, even if it means a little bit today, saving into their retirement account, that means a lot in your long-term future. Mm -hmm. Well, that is uh, great advice for those young people out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, um, we have uh, sort of turning the corner here. We have a lot of grandparents who um, want to help uh, pay for their grandchildren to attend our services or other services. So do you have any specific advice for them? I'm so glad you brought that up, Jill, because we've been framing this conversation for people that may be in their 30s or their 40s or their 50s. But um, for the families that either have, you know, the folks that are grandparents listening for their grandchildren that have uh, kids with learning disabilities um, or, or just other grandparents that may be out there that may be able to help, it's a different type of conversation. And, and again, these, I'm going to have to kind of make up some examples just for our conversation today. But um, having uh, the benefit of grandparents being around or willing to pay, first off, is a huge blessing. I recognize not everyone has that. Um, but for those that do, again, and that's a tool in your toolbox. And you want to be able to wield that in the best way possible. And um, if grandparents are making themselves available or are available to help cover any costs for families with children with learning disabilities, here's a couple of things that they should be thinking about. Um, first, uh, things like a college fund or a health savings account, those have really stringent rules on them. So if a grandparent is already saving into some types of these accounts or products, um, that's different from what we're talking about right now. You know, usually expenses for our children's and any type of extracurricular, that's just money coming out of your checkings and savings or your investments. So I think that's the first thing to think about. What, what lane are we talking about? This is different from college education. This is different from healthcare expenses and so forth. Um, Something else to think about is, you know, the IRS has rules in place for gifting um, and they actually tax or, or can tax the giver of money, not the receiver. That's the first thing that people need to realize. If, you know, if somebody gives me a check for $20,000, um, that's great for me. That's great for you. <laughs> but, but it actually means something for the giver. Um, and so, you know, the IRS has something called the gift tax rule. And in, in 2020, uh, that amount is is about fifteen thousand dollars per person. So if 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 I'm if if I'm a giver and I'm giving somebody more than fifteen thousand dollars, technically I need to keep track of that on my tax return. And you could talk to a tax professional to figure out how to do that, which I'm not. I'm more the financial side. But just know the giving is fifteen thousand dollars for a married couple. That's a combined thirty thousand dollars. Okay. So let's just take an example where some grandparents are providing uh, some financial care uh, for their children and then grandchildren. If they're giving cash to children and grandchildren, they need to be really careful of what they're keeping track of. And they need to, to either stay below that $15,000 or $30,000 amount. Um, or if they go over, they need to keep track of it. 
or they could be paying for expenses directly out of pocket and completely foregoing having to deal with any of that. So what I'm what I'm talking about is let's pretend that a grandparent actually pays for um, any type of expense. That like, could be like buying a car, um, you know, for for children or grandchildren, or that could be paying for the cost of a stole learning center. That is not considered a gift, which is a good thing because whatever that cost amounts to, extracurriculars or a car or a stole learning center, a grandparent can confidently pay that expense. Uh, on behalf of their children or grandchildren, and it doesn't do anything funky with their gifting. So in some ways, you know, if, if you have a, a rich uncle that strikes gold, he could be paying for your car and stole learning center and giving a check for $15,000. And that's all in the green. Uh, you can do that sort of thing. So um, maybe I'll pause there, Jill, but it is, does that help a little bit in thinking about grandparents and the different types of tools that they have in their tool belt? Yeah. So so basically, grandparents or, or someone who is going to pay for something on behalf of someone, they need to pay directly to the institution or they need to, you know, be aware that if it goes over $15,000, they're going to be taxed on anything above the 15000 Is that correct? Yes, I'm splitting hairs a little bit, but I just want someone to know it's not immediately taxable because again, this is one of those things that uh, the IRS has, it's called the gift tax exclusion. And that dollar amount actually is really high. It's $11 million per person. It's right around there. So don't quote me on the exact number, but it's about, so we have a coupon. We can give people um, up to $11 million during our lifetime if we wanted to, before we technically are taxed on it. Uh, but still, you actually you have to keep track of it, and that number can change at any time. Like Congress could wave their finger and make that number a million dollars or something like that. So you you do need to keep track of it. Um, but just know if you give somebody sixteen thousand dollars, the one thousand dollars that's over, you're not taxed on it right now, but you do need to keep track of it. Okay, well that is very helpful. It's a it's a complicated world that finance world. Yeah, can be. <laughs> um, I would like to check in with Lauren and our viewers and see what's happening there in the chat. Well, we have a few people saying hi. We have Kathy, who's she's a, a faithful follower. We see her every week, says, hi, Kathy, good to see you. And we have Lauren, she is another Lauren. She is um, with Fusion Huntington Beach down in our area. Um, they're a great one-on-one -on -one school. Um, and so she's saying hi and checking in. Um, and, and a question we got uh, via email, um, and I don't know, um, John, if you, you know, it's a tax question and we do, I do get this a lot around tax time uh, from our parents is just asking if services like ours that do fund uh, services for kids with disabilities or learning disabilities, can those be tax deductible? Um, or is there any kind of savings that that families can take advantage of that you know of? Really good question. Yeah, mm -hmm. big disclaimer on this. Um, I'm not a CPA, certified public accountant. Um, I fall into the CFP realm, certified financial planner. So some nuances there. Um, I want to say though, broadly speaking, unfortunately, expenses like these are not deductible off of your income. You cannot get, generally speaking, a tax deduction. The asterisk is under very small circumstances, if somebody is either a business owner or has some very unique tax setup, maybe expenses like these uh, can receive a tax deduction or can be written off against income. But my hunch is that a majority of the time, more than 75% of the time, um, families are not allowed any type of tax deduction for expenses like these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that might cut into that 35%, I suppose, that's taken out of taxes and help a little bit, but okay. Um, and then just kind of adding to the conversation, not really a direct question, but we do, I have a lot of families share their stories with me about long-term investments versus, or long-term um, expenses versus short-term expenses. Like families are used to thinking about saving for college. And we do get a lot of college students that that family saved and got them into college and they start their first year yeah. and unfortunately it does not go as planned and so all of a sudden that investment kind of 
falls through yes. um, as, as opposed to paying for something like our services now and then being able to have the opportunity to go to college in the future. So that would be like a more of a long-term yes. um, plan or long-term you know, goal in yes. mind that, and a lot of families tell me like, if we didn't spend the money now to, to attend the center, my child never would have made it to college. And so that's really what we're trying to prevent is kind of a loss of expenses, even though um, you know, we have, as parents, we have the best intentions in saving yeah. for these, these long-term goals that if, you know, if it's not the right circumstances, that expense might, you know, not end the same or yield the same results in the end. So yeah. that's something a lot of our families I know are dealing with. They're kind of outweighing, well, I need to address this issue now. Yeah. And this is more pressing and we may never get to college if, right. if I kind of continue on the same road. Yeah. yeah. And I'll just touch on that. Lorna, you bring up some really good points because, you know, what's at stake is that potentially people could be having double of up, double up expenses and mm -hmm. um, life happens in, in, you know, situation like that totally arise. I mean, the best case scenario is that people find themselves in a way where they can utilize Stowell Learning Center as a tool to help springboard their child and and, you know, and then have that expense now. And, um, you know, and that can help lead to other income or other fruit being that's produced in the future, maybe meaning like independence from their child, you know, or mm -hmm. less expenses down the road or something like that. But that doesn't, maybe that's too rosy. And the reality is some family might have already saved a college fund, um, either like a 529 college fund, mm -hmm. or um, there's another one out there that I'm just blanking on the name right now. Um, but anyways, uh, you know, if pools of money or if buckets of money are available or people had previously set them aside and that's no longer part of their game plan, they should talk to a financial professional, figure out how they can get the most of that bucket of money, understand that in some cases, maybe a tax or a penalty is still is, is applied. Like let's say in the case of a college account, 529, um, mm -hmm. if, you, if you use that money for non-tuition expenses, there's a tax and a penalty but that's not the end of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. That money can still be put to good use uh, regardless of what the, the expense is. And so it's just dealing with the cards that you're dealt. Um, so you bring up a really good point. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. This is really timely for our families, just trying to figure out how to make the best out of a, a bad situation that we're kind of all in right now and take advantage of the time that our family, families finally have this summer to invest in their children's future. So thank you. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Lauren, and, and thank you everyone for joining us and for sharing our broadcast with other families. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stoll here with our guest, John Chapman. Uh, as we were talking about a little bit, the, the changes that students make at Stowell Learning Centers are profound. And we have been at this long enough that we really have seen the impact on their futures, which very often includes college and, and higher degrees and, you know, becoming really successful professionals because we're working with bright kids. There's just some kind of roadblock to their learning. But at the same time, as we've said, you know, it's an investment of time and finances and and you've given us some really good perspectives on how to think about that. So just to summarize, or if there's anything else that you really want people to go away with, what are the key things that you would love for people to take away today? Well, I, I just, I want to speak to the families that feel just a, a sense of anxiety over trying to meet their near-term obligations and struggling to know how they can ever put money away for their long-term. And just know that uh, life for some people can be very long. Uh, you know, in 2020, babies that are born, they may live into their late 90s or hundreds. We have a long life. I want to give people um, hope and a little bit of optimism. If, if you restructure you're, you're thinking to think about what do I want my family to accomplish? What are my goals and the six Fs? What, what's the opportunity for my family? How can I chisel away at my emergency fund or any of my debts 
and then go pour everything into just the here and now and know that uh, you can be creative, maybe ask friends or family um, or, you know, shift your frame of reference on what your lifestyle is supposed to be right now. Um, but I just encourage people, I guess two last quick things, Jill, if, if you need to reach out to a financial professional, two resources, um, one is a service called NAPFA, N-A-P-F-A dot org, NAPFA dot org. You can search for a fiduciary uh, a financial advisor in your area. Another is called Zoe Financial. Z-O-E financial. If you just type that in, that takes you through a filtering process and, and proposes two or three advisors in your area also that are, that are fiduciaries. So just some resources for families to think about. So again, thanks, Jill, for, for letting me talk today. This was fun. Well, thank you for being here. And, um, you know, John has an outstanding podcast called The John Chapman Show. So Creative be title. sure and check that out. And uh, we are going to put up his contact information. So get ready. You might want to screenshot this. Here's how you can get a hold of John for help or questions with financial planning. So thank you again, John, for joining us today. This is, you know, finances are a tough subject for all of us. And, um, you know, I think you've given us some good perspectives and and simplified it enough that, you know, that it kind of makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, my, I just want to encourage people again, if they're, they're feeling um, like they're, they're having a hard time or that, you know, there's some stumbling blocks in their way, just be proactive. I, if you, you know, take a little bit of step of action, whatever that is, talk to a spouse or a family member, or reach out to a professional. So um, yeah, this is super fun, Jill. Thank, thanks for letting me be here. Oh, it was great having you. Thank you so much. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific on Facebook and YouTube. Next Tuesday, we'll be talking to Dr. Valerie Lamb about how vision problems you never realized that you or your child have could affect reading or learning. Stowell Learning Centers are open for remote sessions and screenings, so you can access our services wherever you are in the world. We are also open on a limited basis for on-site students, which has been a real treat. We've missed you, students. Uh, we've missed seeing your faces in person. Uh, and as Lauren shared, this is a unique time in history when Education for all students has essentially stalled out a little bit or plateaued, and that gives our bright but struggling learners the opportunity to take advantage of this summer to close the gap a little more rapidly than they otherwise might have. So if you would like to find out about summer intensive programs or speak with someone about your child, call us at 877-774-0444 or visit us at stowellcenter.com. Thank you again, John, for your insights and perspective. So helpful. And I just want to give a huge shout out to all of you who have tuned in and subscribed and shared. You are awesome. We'll see you next week. <music>